um, we'll start with roll call. We'll get the, um, we'll get things moving. We'll start with our commissioners. Uh, Commissioner Lynn Anderson. I'm right here. Hi. Um, Commissioner Jim Blake. Hi. Uh, Commissioner Alternate Destry Bunnell. Hi. Hi, Destry. Uh, Commissioner April Rose Castillo. Hi. Hi. Commissioner Jane Dahl. Hi, everyone. Commissioner Sharon Dunham. Hey. Commissioner Shelley Fagan. Here. Hi. Commissioner R. Ryan Hendricks. Present. Commissioner Shoshana Lansford. Here. Hi. Commissioner Sue Pike. Here. Commissioner Peg Silloway. Commissioner Cindy Trimble. Here. And uh, commissioners Gina Wilson and commissioner uh, Rebecca Benoit wrote that they were unable to make it tonight. We also have with us uh, Councilor Laura Mitchell. Hi, and our staff liaison Beth Toby. Hi. And thank you to um, our vice chair Jane Dahl who has graciously um, offered to help us keep time uh, on tonight's meeting so that we stick to our agenda timings. And we also wanted to uh, quickly point out that uh, while the specific uh, agenda listing timings are correct as shown on the agenda that was sent out, um, so this meeting will go a little longer so that we can cover uh, some ground. The timing at the top of the cover sheet that has the Zoom info, that time shows 6.30 to 8 p.m. So we just wanted to point out in case there was any confusion um, if anyone was only looking at the um, the header timing that shows that we are ending at 8 p.m. and they really have to leave at 8 p.m., uh, that's fine. But just so you know, the agenda timings uh, showing to 8.30 are correct. Were there any questions on that front before we move along? Okay, great. All right, so next on our agenda are council updates from Councilor Laura Mitchell. Hello, everyone. Um, I just wanted to um, say I'm happy to be here and give you guys a few updates since I've seen you last. Um, first, I wanted to say I'm going to jet out of here at the public comment period tonight. I'm going to help my daughter with a project. <clears throat> and so um, usually I'll stay, but once in a while it'll hit at the same time. So, um, but so since I've seen you last, um, we have been, you know, working, getting everything done that we've been trying to tirelessly do. But one of the interesting things, which might appear not interesting, but that I would share is um, we're working on uh, wireless communications. So some of you might see like memes, um, you know, with all these telephone poles or lines everywhere. And that's what we don't want in Beaverton, right? We do not want that situation happening. So it's interesting because I didn't really understand until I was on council that we don't really get to dictate a lot of that. The FCC really um, cultivates the, the rules when it comes to that. And we can't create any barriers in their mind, even if let's say we didn't want all of these providers all over the place, we have to be fair and we have to uh, follow rules and regulation. So, you know, if ever you see a pole or an antenna that is unsightly, uh, feel free to let us know um, because it's always nice to incorporate your feedback with, um, you know, trying to dance the delicate dance of FCC regulations. So that's, that's always a little bit interesting. Um, another thing that we've been doing, uh, which I mentioned last time, is establishing budget goals. I don't know if any of you saw last night, we were able to get through a huge amount of um, goal setting last night and uh it was it was just amazing our interim city manager kurt is uh kurt wilson is just amazing he really brings this different perspective and these organization skills that help us serve our public 
at you know an effective rate that we we've not really been able to um we've always served at a high rate but this is just with elegance you know the tools that he brings and being able to really define what it is and not letting us get caught up in the details right government's always tripping over red tape what takes so long to get stuff done and it's just nice to be able to vet through details clearly so last night we we were able to engage at that level and it's really new for us because um generally the budget is pretty much made by the time it gets to us and now because of our government change we're able to engage at an earlier rate and really help cultivate what it looks like with regard to executing goals that we've set so there's a little bit more control so throughout the year as we talk to our constituents and we set goals we're able to really kind of help push the money where the mouths are you know and, and really try and get stuff done so that's really exciting um and then uh, it, it really takes us from the level of influence to action. So that accountability piece really, um, when those questions come our way, it's gonna be with a lot more intention, the answers that you get, because we are going to, I mean, we work with our staff and there are a lot of other internal goals, but to be able to have that influence and, and take that action right out of the gate is really exciting. And then um, lastly, uh, amongst all the other stuff that we're doing, we really finalized the uh, public engagement plan for our uh, recruitment of city manager. And so we're really looking forward to that, getting the feedback. If you go onto our city website, uh, you'll be able to take the survey that's out there. And your feedback is so important because it hits on a lot of the priorities and a lot of the really um, hot topics that are going on right now. So when you're thinking of somebody who really drives the city forward, what's important to you? And so I encourage you to go to the website. Um, that's the City of Beaverton website. Go to the uh, government tab and then go down to the city manager tab and you'll be able to take that survey. It's open until April 8th or April 11th, something like that. So the sooner the better. And uh, with that public engagement plan, we're really going to put out their social media posts, publications, and the survey, of course, which we get to actually read all of the results because when we're sitting down and we're deliberating about who the best candidate is, we're able to really put your feedback first and foremost, that's why we're here. You know, we're here to serve you and to have that feedback right out of the gate really helps us be better servants. So um, that's really exciting. So that's, that is everything that I have for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for Councillor Mitchell? Yes. Um, it sounds like there's a glowing endorsement for Kurt in his temporary position. Um, I guess it's how interested is he in the permanent position or how interested are you at looking at him as a permanent replacement? You know, from the times we've asked him, it's something that is not in his goal um, with regard to this position. He's really at a place in his career where he wants to take on different challenges and, you know, kind of help level set people and, and their goals and then move on to the next. So, you know, it's kind of a spoiler alert, right? Like you get the best of the best and you just like, oh man, now we've got to go and get somebody who can fill these shoes. And so that's going to be whoever we, you know, get really has to really hit that bar and, and above, so. Laura, does that mean going back to Stockton or does that mean something else? I think it means something else. You know, I think um, Stockton is a, is a goal of his past and something that he's accomplished. And, you know, he just, he is probably one of the smartest people I've ever met in my life. And um, that what he brings, I, I hope to stay connected with him because uh, that he's just a wealth of knowledge. And so whoever ends up lucky enough to have him at their city or whatever project that they're doing, they're really lucky. Is he providing any recommendations for people he knows that could be at the same level? Yes, he's he's been out there, you know, kind of pushing the word and, and trying to get good people sent our way so that's that's exciting because you know you think birds of a feather right if you kind of flock together you've got that those similar interests and perhaps that same type of drive and commitment to knowledge and success so it's exciting to see and i've heard that we've had a lot of um, applicants so far like 23 so far which is really large for that type of position so that's exciting 
wanted to let everyone know I threw that link in the chat box for the city manager survey. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so next on our agenda is a grantee spotlight. Uh, we're welcoming Melissa Riley from the Beaverton Civic Theater. Hi, Melissa. Hi, thank you guys for having me tonight. Thanks for joining us. And uh, maybe Beth, um, could you uh, maybe provide a brief overview on the, um, reminding us which grant uh, Beaverton Civic Theater received? Yeah, actually, I believe, uh, Melissa, correct me if I'm wrong, that you received both a project grant this last year as well as a um, COVID relief grant, correct? Yes, that's correct. All right, do you mean to tell you guys about our projects? Is that what I should do? Uh, yes. Yeah, please do. And, and we were also sort of just interested in um, that you guys have adapted really well to the virtual environment and how that's going for you. Um, the good, the bad, the ugly kind of thing. <laughs> All right, I'll start with um, our project grant, which was the um, Snowfest program. So we received the grant for that, and it was our second year to be able to present that program in Beaverton. And the first year, um, it was about placemaking and bringing the community together in one place. And we did that over at Cedar Hills Crossing at our Playhouse location. And we had close to uh, 750 individuals attend three days of um, arts with theater performance. We had the Beaverton City Library doing story times and crafts and we had professional performer there doing um, shows. And so when we went to figure out how to transition to Snowfest this past year with COVID, we still wanted to be able to bring the community together and to celebrate the arts together. That was very important to us. And Snowfest isn't about just turning on Zoom and kind of zoning out and watching something. It's about engaging. And so we had to figure out how do we transition where we had professional performers performing in that environment where you're used to being an active audience member and being part of that energy to something on Zoom. So it's just not like watching a video. Um, so when we, one of the things we did was we created seven different activity packets for the crafts, um, being inclusive to make sure that people actually had the supplies at home to be able to participate. Um, and we received additional funding in addition to the grant we received from the arts program from the Central Beaverton Neighborhood Association to be able to create these kits and make them accessible for pickup at the library at Beaverton High School during their free lunches and also at those elementary school during their free lunch program and also during their pickup times that teachers had stuff for the elementary kids. And so we distributed over 1500 of these kits. Now the kits were also a great way to get our volunteers active again because all of the items needed to be assembled. Um, so I've brought a few of them with me here today. So this was, um, our kit for we one of our performances became make the puppets and perform with us and a local artist uh joel enriquez designed um the characters which are probably hard to see and we included all the popsicle sticks um in the baggie and everything was in these watertight ziploc bags because we didn't want them getting ruined on the way home or if it was raining during pickup um, and really, so it, it looks like something fun. It's not like hidden in a bag. It's like, wow, you can see you're gonna do a fun craft. And so then we had 19 programs throughout the weekend. And the goal was to have people stay because we still wanted to have um, that feeling of connectivity and sticking around for placemaking. So for example, we had creating the puppets as one activity and we had our staff leading through like coloring them and exactly how to create them by putting them on your popsicle sticks. And during this time to allow the families to color, we also were um, sharing trivia about the different animals or different characters in the history of the story of the gingerbread man, because we wanted them then to stay for the next section, which was the performance piece. And instead of just watching our staff perform, we took the different characters and we read the story so that the families, the kids could interact and actually be performing on screen with us. And it was so fun to watch the little kids trying to hold the characters. 
um, and figure it out with us. And that was also part of, of learning too, because we worked through it as if they were part of the show with us. So we did a reading of the script and just worked through what the characters were like and how they might say their line and maybe how they might move fast or slow. And then we did a kind of technical dress rehearsal where we really worked through how are we gonna hold all of these in one hand and then still do this in the other hand. We wanted them to feel successful. So that was another part of it. And then we did a third run of the whole show again. And this time it was kind of like our performance. Um, and it was a really you know, simple adaptation where the lines were repeated so that it was structured with, um, early literacy in mind. Beaverton Civic Theater does a lot with early literacy and partners with the library. Um, so we did that. And then on top of that, to help create that connectivity and come back tomorrow, um, we invited them to come back tomorrow where we were gonna do costume crafts with the same story. And so that's how we kind of kept stringing things together. Um, another example of a kit that we did was um, tambourines with bells and paper plates. And so they could pick that kit up. And here's a um, final tambourine. And so we did the tambourine craft right before Music Together Beaverton, who partnered with us, came in with their family sing-along. And then we incorporated the tambourine in music as a musical instrument that we played as part of the sing-along there. Um, and that was great fun as well. And then the last kit, that I brought was our stained glass window. So you picked up a kit full of tissue paper and clear contact paper. And then during our craft time, and we called this one a community, a neighborhood um, type craft. So you can see you decorate the contact paper with your stained glass and make a design, a couple different samples of how that came out. But for this one, then we encouraged our participants to hang it in their windows so that Hopefully as you're going out for a walk um, and getting some fresh air, you might just see one in your neighbor's window and know that they were part of Snowfest too. Um, so those are just a few of the activities. And then, as I mentioned for early literacy, the Beaverton City Library came in and partnered and did uh, four different story times with us. And they actually had a really great comment because they got to see during those story times families that aged out of their library programs. So it was really fun to reconnect. And so the participants were like, I remember you. And that sense of connectivity during the time of COVID and when you're trying to celebrate the holidays and everything is different, it was just so refreshing to feel that. And the library commented that some of their story times got so much more visibility and attendance by being part of Snowfest that it was a really positive um, partnership for them. Um, and Music Together did the sing-alongs with us and Beaverton Civic Theater also did some acting programs to get kids up and moving. And I think that's a good run through of how that went. So all in all, so that first year when we were at Cedar Hills Crossing, we had you know, 550 people participate through the weekend. Um, and a lot of them asking if this was an annual thing and if it's gonna happen again. And so this year transitioning to Zoom, we reached 1500. So we doubled the, um, the impact that we had in the community and people picked up the kits and we're just so excited to be part of it. Um, any questions about Snowfest? Well, I hope that some of you could were part of it or when we do Snowfest again this year in a different version that uh, you and your families will join us. Um, and then you also wanted to know how we transitioned during this time of COVID. So I think that we were, pretty successful in that we continue to just um, create programming and adapt our programming so that we could continue to stay connected to our community. Uh, the mission of the Beaverton Civic Theater is to include uh, our community on stage, behind the scenes and in the audience. And we wanted more than anything to just stay connected in a really meaningful way. Um, so we also received this past year a grant from the, um, for welcoming week. And what we did was we created a multicultural version of Cinderella. And so we took the German version and we took the French version, which is most close to the Disney version. And we also had the Chinese and the Hindi version. We connected with those uh, cultures in our communities. So the German community, the Hindi community and the Chinese community. And we created a show 
that was all virtual and we pre-recorded each actor individually so that we were all COVID safe. Um, and we wove this together to create a show that really highlighted how all the cultures have something similar in, um, in common. So our goal was really to say that we're not all that different and we wanted to create a common discussion point so that people would feel connected to another culture and be curious and wanna learn an open conversation. And what we found from that was that we created some great partnerships with the Chinese community and the Hindi community and they're just asking to be part of something that we do again. Um, and that premiered um, as part of Welcoming Week and it received um, significant number of views. I don't have the number with me, but it was, I wanna say close to 600 um, people watching our virtual show. So we invested a lot of time and volunteer hours in that. That was another project where our volunteers could still stay engaged and create costumes at home and we could drop stuff off and we could quarantine it long enough and things like that. So that was a really great project. And you can st I can send a link to that um, to Beth after this is over and you can still watch that online. And we took our education program and we saw it as an opportunity to develop our education program in online. And um, we started with our Girl Scout workshop program, which we had well established with our shows where Girl Scouts would come in and earn a badge with us in the afternoon and stay and see the show that evening. So for example, with Clue, when we were in the Beaverton City Library, we had a detective from the police um, office visit us and talk to us about like fingerprinting and detective work. And we would also do some other activities with the girls. And then they would stay and watch Clue the musical. And that was great fun. And we had close to 100 Girl Scouts come through that program when it was in the library. So we transitioned um, our detective workshop online along with several others. So we have a 14 series collection of workshops we've transitioned online. And the re response from people we have, oh, and we reached um, families all across the United States. Um, and it has just been overwhelming to see how many people want to be doing this. And their comments are just so supportive and phenomenal. And the kids are just learning so much and so are the parents. And we expanded then into wizarding workshops and time travel detectives. So since June, all of our workshops together, we've had um, a thousand participants. And so we're just about ready to launch our next series of, of workshops. Wow, um, this is all really great, Melissa. <laughs> um, th thanks for updating us and, and sharing all of this. Uh, we have some questions, it looks like, in the audience for you. Okay, I'm ready. Um, uh, Jeep, I think I saw your hand uh, first. Jeep's uh, um, a visitor to our meeting tonight. Hey, yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Melissa, it sounds like you're doing amazing uh, things uh, craft-wise as well as music-wise with the community. And um, I, you know, as owner of uh, Five Star Guitars here in Beaverton, I'd love to know, uh, you know, if there's a good contact that you can shoot over to me for the Music Together uh, uh, facilities. I'm, I'm not too familiar with them and I'd, I'd love to see there's any way that as, you know, a retailer of music and instructors that we can, uh, you know, help out in any way. I mean, I'm, I'm from here and I'm all about music for here. So uh, yeah, if you have any contacts that have to do with that, I'd, I'd love to hear more and thank you so much. We appreciate it. Yeah, that would be great. If you wanna add like your email to the chat, I'll make sure to connect with you after. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. and. Uh... Uh, Jane, I saw your hand also. Yes, and Melissa, oh my gosh, um, amazing, amazing things that you were doing. Um, just some quick questions. The activity packs, did you have to turn anyone away because no. of funding? Okay. Yeah, no, we actually, we didn't have to. We had about 50 of each packet left. Um, we had, yeah, so we ended up with leftover. And one of the things we also did ahead of time is we made um, a kind of like a pre-order thing because we wanted to make sure that people could get them. And so people that pre-ordered, we set them aside. Um, and we even worked out specific times that they weren't able to pick up at one of our um, pre-assigned kind of pickup where we were passing out and distributing things. 
Excellent. And yeah. I know you mentioned the, the Girl Scout project um, was nationwide. What about your other activities? Were, were they um, offered outside of Beaverton or could they be? Yes, they absolutely um, could have been. Let's see, for Snowfest, so we do take quite seriously um, kind of like Zoom safety. And so for Snowfest, we didn't just post the, um, the link online in general, you had to register. And in fact, Beaverton Civic Theater staff, we all took turns during that three day weekend of monitoring the registration so that as soon as someone registered, we were able to get them that link immediately and get in. Um, and we did collect zip codes from everyone. I forgot to look before I came tonight, but I can definitely send you as a follow-up how far that program reached. Excellent. Okay. Um, no problem. And I also know that our, our Cinderella project definitely had international attention because of our cultural connections. And they were nice. just so excited to share it with their families and to have been part of it. They were just blown away by how great it turned out and so proud to have been working with us. It was really great. Excellent. Well, very impressive. And thank you so much. I just as the timekeeper, we have two minutes left. So uh, I'll turn it over to Sharon. And you're on mute. Alyssa, great to see you again. Hey, hey um, I'm going to take this offline in the interest of time. But um, we too at the Village Gallery got a grant from back. Um, to do art kits for free that we hand out, but our audience is mostly like homeless. Um, Home Plate, Bridge Meadows is an intergenerational um, community here in Beaverton, Domestic Violence Resource Center, severe weather shelter for those people who are coming off the street um, and have a place to stay, Family Promise, which is families that are homeless, and also um, THPRD, the Recmobile. I want to offline talk to you about other potential audiences that we could be going out to give these free art kits to um, in the remaining time that we have, which is through the summer. So um, I, I'll take it offline and we can talk later. That sounds great. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Sharon. Thank you so much again, Melissa. This is uh, awesome. And, and we we loved hearing from you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and thank you for your support. Oh, Jim has a question. Jim, sorry, we can't hear you. If, I just want to, it's more of a shout out and just saying that what Melissa is doing in these tough times, especially in, in theater is amazing. Um, for the new members of the BCT or anybody who, or uh, the BAC has not gone to the Civic Theater, when things get back to normal, um, I've enjoyed so many hours uh, and, and, and I want to see everybody there once we're, things get back to normal. It is an institution in Beaverton and Melissa does such an amazing job. Her whole, her whole support system, everybody's great. And, uh, and it shouldn't be missed out when things get back to normal. So I'm so glad that you're keeping things moving on and can't wait. You know. Thank you, Jim. And thanks everyone. It's been great to be here tonight. Thank you so much. All right. Oh, Sharon, do you still have a question? Or is that a previous hand? That's the old, okay. Okay, great. So next up on our agenda is Chris Azukian from the Research Center. Hi, Chris. Hi, Allison. Hi, everybody. Good to see you tonight. Uh, great to be with you all again. Uh, I'd like to give you an update on the Patricia Research Center for the Arts. Uh, we're in the middle, as you may have known, of a 100 days, 100K campaign to close the gap on the private fundraising side. And I'm happy to report that is going really well. Uh, we have been so pleased uh, and, and so inspired by the response in the community um, to uh, that invitation to participate in that campaign. Gifts have been coming in uh, from $5 to $11 to $100 to $25,000. We uh, are continuing to leave this campaign open until May 11th for the 100th day, and we actually fully anticipate going over the goal, which is amazing to say during these tough times uh, and how important people see this center. Um, and when we uh, anticipate going over the goal, we will we'll also look at you know, the additional costs uh, that uh, the center uh, will bear to be complete due to COVID, as I mentioned to you last time. 
Um, all of these gifts will be put to good use in the construction budget and bringing us near to our goal so that the center doesn't take on more construction debt um, as we open. Uh, in other news, we're launching a Beaverton City employee campaign next week as part of the $100,000 day, uh, $100, campaign. And also in Multnomah Village, uh, the Art in the Village Gallery is hosting a fundraiser for the center on April 10th, and we're very happy for that. Uh, more details to come, we'll send you that information uh, as it becomes available. On the seat naming front, fill the seats campaign, we've sold, uh, sold well, sold's not the right word, named uh, 363 seats out of the 550. And thanks to also many of you who have donated to that campaign. We only have 187 left to go, which is uh, really staggering. It's, uh, we might actually sell out the whole thing, <laughs> which we didn't quite think we'd do a couple of years ago, but we're, we're there. Um, and also you remember the $1.5 million grant from the state uh, lottery bond, uh, which was rescinded due to COVID. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back. We're hopeful that it will be reinstated during this legislative session, uh, but we no promises, we don't know yet, uh, but it's likely that we'll hear back in, in June at the end of the session. We've had some wonderful uh, media coverage. Uh, some of you may have caught it uh, on More Good Day Oregon, uh, on COIN, KGW, and KPTV. Every, all of them are an, uh, anxious to, uh, to get an insider's peek and to put it on the news. So we're very lucky to receive that coverage. Um, if you haven't seen it, I'll be happy to send you links after this uh, email so you can access them wherever there, there are links available. Um, the campaign team uh, uh, is beginning to do all the things they need to do to bring the campaign efforts to a close by June 30th. Um, and they remain uh, poised to uh, continue those fundraising efforts right up until the last day of the fiscal year, which at that point will transition into uh, what we call PRC operations, ramping up uh, solely for that organization and opening the center. Uh, we are still aiming for a March 2022 opening. Nothing has changed since I last talked to you. Uh, that's still uh, the goal. There's a lot of work happening on that side. Staff hiring, as you know, the production manager position is open. It actually just closed two days ago. We have um, uh, resumes from all over the country, uh, West Coast, of course, primarily, but then Utah, Nevada, Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, uh, starting interviews next week. We have some really qualified candidates that I'm excited to interview uh, for next week. This is a this is an exciting job to open a new art center in this very supportive community with a lot of creative energy. So, um, and especially now when unfortunately a lot of people are out of work in the arts, uh, puts us actually in, in a decent position to recruit, recruit somebody really qualified for that position. And that person will be responsible for all of the stage elements uh, and the safety of the stage and uh, making sure everything is mounted appropriately on stage, including uh, hiring of stage crew, et cetera, and all those things. Um, as I mentioned last time, we're working on a management agreement uh, to operate the center between the city of Beaverton and the Beaverton Arts Foundation, which will reconstitute itself as PRCA Inc, as uh, doing business as PRCA Inc. Um, so that is going well. Uh, we've had some great progress recently and we're working that out uh, between the city myself and a work group at the city. Um, uh, again, and also we're preparing for the first year of operations, the budget. Um, I've drafted a kind of a three year roadmap for the first few years. And then I will present not only to the board of the center, which is the Arts Foundation Board, but also to council uh, for the appropriation amount of lodging tax funding to the center for 21, 22 next year. And that will happen uh, in the next month or so. Um, and then I, as I like to always give you to round this out, uh, I'd love to give you a construction update. Um, and I didn't start there because I, I wanted to end with photos. Here are some uh, photos, recent photos. This is taken about 10 days ago, 15 days ago of the center. Um, and do you all see my PowerPoint presentation? Just making sure. Yes, yes, okay, I see nodding hands, great. This is a, a, a view from Hall Boulevard. Uh, you can see 
And what I love about this is you can start seeing the sky window here and the, the light coming in into the lobby. Uh, this photo was taken about three hours ago um, and it's really coming along. This is the view from the bridge on Hall, like the pedestrian bridge there. Uh, and uh, here's a view of the inside, the lobby, first floor. This is our grand lobby. And uh, uh, of course, all the wood isn't in yet. That's coming soon. Uh, the first pieces of panel, dug fur, uh, dug fur panels have arrived on site uh, a couple of days ago and they'll start going up soon. And this is kind of a completed view. You can see the difference there. Uh, you'll have, we'll have the wood slats. We'll have the public art piece, which you all know uh, well, called Puff, hanging in the middle and rotating. There's the, on the floor, there's this imprint of Puff. Uh, it's, it's stained concrete, which we're testing right now. Here's a second. Second floor view, uh, really beautiful space, and then the um, finished view of the second floor. So it's really getting there. Um, here's the view of uh, that same second floor looking out to the creek with the wood curtain wall and the windows there along what we call this, this area down here, we call the bridge. It's named by the Schnitzer family, actually, um, this area of the, of the center. Here's a view of the stage. It's uh, also coming along. Um, it's uh, uh, lots of work is about to begin installing wood paneling, like I said, inside the theater as well. That work is gonna take a couple of months and uh, the, facility, the inside is getting quite tight as walls go up and uh, workers uh, maintain social distancing. Um, so uh, especially with wood panels going up, these are large panels. There's lots of workarounds that are uh, partners at Skanska are, are uh, devising to make sure workers don't get too close when they're uh, when they're putting those panels up. Um, this is from earlier today. Uh, Mayor Lacey Beatty got her first tour of the space, and this is her and her uh, two staff members. Uh, she loved the space. It was very informative for her to actually walk through, and also the garage as well, the adjacent garage. So you can see already bit has changed since that last photo. The stage has been painted and things are happening. Back to a couple of weeks ago, this is the stage from on stage looking out into the audience to the left. And then we go to the garage, which is completed, which is pretty much complete. This is the north wall of the garage, uh, which will have the public artwork gather by Will Schlau that you all have uh, approved and know well. That's going to go up in the Next month or so, you'll see that going up. And that'll be uh, really exciting once that's uh, up there. And of course, this is common threads uh, on the other corner of the garage that's already up. And then finally, uh, this piece uh, at the fulcrum site called ribbons uh, will be installed later uh, this spring, early summer on the plaza once, that, once the plaza goes in. So lots of exciting stuff. Uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. And I'm, I'm coming to you live from the, in front of the rendering of a room we call the lab. Uh, this is on the second floor. It's a large 1800 square foot space. I love this room. I think it's gonna be used uh, highly sought after uh, for educational initiatives, meetings and events, um, rehearsals, all sorts of things and at classes as well. Thank you, Chris. This, it's so exciting to see uh, all of this coming to life. Um, does anyone have any co uh, questions for Chris or comments? I want. I have a quick question. Oh, go ahead. Oh, uh, hey, Chris. Um, You're right. Question. Long time no talk. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? Okay. Um, so, opening in uh, 2022. Um, I assume that uh, you've done outreach into organizations to fill the space either uh, as a presenter or, um, or as organizations that, that um, uh, wanna use the space. Uh, what, what's the level of, um, of engagement or, um, or public interest in using the space that you've seen so far? Have you been approached by people? Is there excitement around that? Yeah, thank you, great question. So there's a wide variety of uh, people interested in the space. I've gotten, so I've, in the last couple of years, I spent a lot of time, well, before COVID, uh, especially when I first got here, 
spent a lot of time, time with arts organizations, talking to them about their capacity, where they are, and their interest to use the space. Um, I've on, off and on touched base and continued those conversations and those relationships. Those include local organizations as well as local Beaverton specific organizations, as well as uh, Portland organizations and even some Hillsborough organizations, uh, just to let them know, right? It's, it was my kind of uh, uh, tour around and, and getting them engaged. There is, there is a lot of interest in using the space. Uh, some organizations, the space is uh, not quite right for them, right? Because it's too big, right? Uh, at 550 seats or it's too small. Um, there are uh, a number of organizations in Portland that are interested in uh, kind of outreach out here and establishing themselves from organizations like Portland Baroque Orchestra, for example, to uh, the Oregon Symphony will have some sort of presence here. Uh, of course, not a big, huge orchestra. Uh, we have a good size stage that will fit a 60 to 70 piece orchestra, but not anything kind of larger than that, uh, to Oregon Ballet Theater and their OBT2 program to um, uh, a number of other organizations that are escaping me right now that, uh, you know, Chamber Music Northwest, uh, uh, Friends of Chamber Music, et cetera, uh, Portland Piano International, the piano series. So the classical music organizations are very interested. Um, uh, the, I think the trick now is uh, one, it's capacity regardless of COVID, but coming out of COVID, uh, well, I'll say this, uh, any, any kind of new art center, as Ryan, you know, especially well, is like people have to get in there to try it out, right? And uh, try out the space if it works for them and, and also uh, to build audiences. Uh, you know, the old adage of build it, they will come works great in the movies, but it's not quite true. <laughs> You've got to build it and do some great programming and invest money and time and develop volunteer base and a host of things to make it work. So it, it takes time. I think it's going to be right now, the conversations I'm having it are tricky because for example, I had a conversation today with Whitebird, right? And um, they're interested, but then there's also, uh, there's the economics of certain dance groups coming to a 550 seat theater and the fee structure and all that, but also um, there are a lot of organizations who don't know what's going to happen after COVID. There's a lot of uncertainty based on vaccine rollout and when we can all be together again. Uh, so for them to start thinking about April of 22, March through May, April, May, uh, it's actually still early when in a normal cycle, this would be almost too late, you know, a year in advance. So it's, it's a weird cycle this time. So the first, I keep saying that first year where we're gonna be open four months out of the fiscal year, the next year, um, is going to be a it's going to be a celebration period, but it's all it's going to be a kind of anom anomalous for the first couple of years, and it's not until year three or four where we start really getting feedback from audiences, see what you want, in, in, try some things out, see how people respond, and then uh, get the machine up and running. Um, so. Yeah, we're gonna need we're gonna need a lot of help and ambassadorship and and spreading of the word and but our goal right now is to really build so, at something like get the foundation right and then build on top of it. Well, thank you, Allison. We are out of time. I didn't know if you wanted to take some more questions or um, how you wanna. Sure. Um, well, I see that uh, Jeep. I think we have a question from you. Is that a is that a raised hand? I see. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a fairly quick question, I believe. Um, so uh, we, uh, as uh, as music instructors, as a retail shop, we do, in the past, we have done uh, student concerts out in the public, uh, usually quarterly for the most part in the past, obviously not in 2020 uh, as much, but um, we, we do a, a few that are out in the open air when, when it, uh, when it, can happen shoot park uh hills road downtown center but we also do some indoor is this the type of facility at uh 550 capacity uh we have over 220 students a week um and their families that we put together bands and do sort of a, a sort of like a you know school of rock sort of deal or whatnot um 
is this the type of facility that would be a potential to house that in the future when obviously it's safe to get back? Um, if so, please uh, send me over the information and I can get it to my manager of my student concerts. Thank you. Yeah, Jeep. Actually, I, I knew of your, your business several years ago when I landed uh, and I've never, uh, we, I've never had a chance to connect. So yes, I'll send you, I'll put my email in the chat. Uh, that This is that kind of facility. Yes, absolutely. So let's keep talking further. I'm gonna put my email in there right now. I have a real quick question, that background, Chris, that you have of that room. Um, one, it, are there more than one, is there more than one room that's like that? And two, um, it looks like in this uh, drawing that uh, there are acoustic panels on the ceiling and potentially on at least one wall. Are there acoustic panels on all walls except for the window or just the ceiling and end walls? Uh, good question. De ceiling and that end wall uh, are the main paneling, uh, is the main pa paneling. And this is the main room that's divisible into two. Uh, as far as rentable spaces, there's this room, the lobby for events when the, when the theater's not being used. Uh, we, there's a smaller room we call the pavilion room, which is on the plaza and all glass with one draped uh, 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 side. That's a smaller room. It's 800 square feet. This is 1800 square feet. So let me correct myself. It's, it's two main rooms plus the lobby and the theater to rent. If that makes sense. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Great to see you all. Yeah. Real quick, you know, you know, not getting off the hook. You're not getting off the hook. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. You mentioned about, yeah, build it and they will come sort of thing. And it's something to think about. I don't need to you know, answer now, but yeah, let us know how, you know, the, that we uh, and the Arts Commission can help to build a groundswell to bring on, as well as, of course, arts programs and, and just give us direction and uh, we're here for you. Jim, thank you so much. We didn't plant that, folks. Jim said that on his own. <laughs> no, I, I really have, yeah, you all, you know, or I've said this to you before, when I landed here, it's like I almost wanted to hug every single one of you. It's like, you're my people. <laughs> and so, so thank you so much that there will definitely be times to activate. Uh, so even more so and in different ways. So thank you for that. Chris, I didn't get to add, ask my question, so I will ask it offline later. Yeah, email me, Sharon, please, or okay. call me. All thank right, you. thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Chris, thank you. Take care. So our next agenda item is public comment. Uh, we have two visitors this evening. Um, we have uh, Jeep. Uh, Jeep, would you like to introduce yourself to the whole group? I, I, I know you were maybe speaking at the beginning uh, before the meeting started, but would you like to quickly quickly introduce yourself to everyone? Oh yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, thank you for having me this evening. Uh, I'm uh, Jeep from the net, uh, nickname, uh, but uh, uh, you know, born and raised basically uh, right around here. And uh, I'm one of the owners of Five Star Guitars and uh, we uh, have been, uh, you know, supporting the musical community for the last 22 years. Me and my three, uh, two partners um, have owned the shop uh, for the last nine years. Uh, and we all worked there for over 10 years before that, uh, buying out the founder about nine years ago. And yeah, we do, you know, instruments, repairs, um, and uh, uh, in instruction of all sorts of different music. You know, we primarily focus on guitar when it comes to retail and repairs, but we, uh, we have instructors that are acclaimed. Um, uh, as, as, as it was mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Jennifer Batten, phenomenal guitar virtuoso uh you know we're lucky enough to have her teaching the shop as well as you know lee allen knowles who has uh, studied piano and theatrical arts um uh, at the conservatory of san francisco as well as other places um any anyhow we uh we love music we love th that side of the arts is definitely our specialty and um that's why i felt it important to be here tonight you know um that combined with our recent national or international acclamation of becoming the dealer of the year for the uh, National Academy of Music Merchants um, uh, is a huge honor for us. And it just highlights how 
how central Beaverton, Oregon can be to music, especially and and the arts in general. You know, we're a small little town that I basically grew up in and and we are making ripples worldwide. And it's really, really cool, as well as supporting new players and new musicians and new artists. You know, I love the the popsicle sticks and bags and all of that to get get people of younger ages and whatnot really, really, really into all of the arts because it's such a hugely important thing to obviously all of us or else we wouldn't be here tonight. So thank you for having me. Well, congratulations on, on the NAM nod and, and thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, we also have Kevin Gowers joining us. Kevin, are you online? Okay, maybe he stepped Sorry. away. Oh, oh, Kevin, hi. Hi, I'm online. Um, yeah, uh, just a, an artist uh, that moved recently to the area and just wanted to get kind of an idea of what was going on um, in, in Beaverton. Um, happy to be here and to be involved. Thank you. Oh, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Uh, Kevin, uh, could you share with us uh, what type of artist um, or what your arts modality is? <laughs> Um, well, you know, I, I recently um, retired from the Air Force and decided this is where we wanted to live. Um, I, I do um, fine painting and sculpture and silver, silver work, uh, jewelry and, and such. But um, right now I'm, do, I'm doing a lot of painting. Great. Well, thank yeah. you so much for joining us. Thank you. And did we have anyone else? Thank you. Okay. Uh, so moving right along, next on our agenda is approvals of the minutes from our February 10th meeting. Did anyone have any um, items to discuss? It's okay. If there's no items for discussion, do we have a motion to approve the minutes as they are? I'll approve the minutes from February 10th. Make, I'll make a motion. Thanks, second. Jane. Do we have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Shelley. All in favor of approving the minutes as shown, uh, please raise a hand or a thumbs up. Great. Anyone opposed? Great. The minutes are approved. Thank you, everyone. And look at that, we're a minute early now. <laughs> Okay, so next on our agenda is uh, the topic of city events. Uh, welcome to Shannon Mason, who is the city events program manager, and she will share an update on the city's events program and COVID restrictions, as well as current trends in event planning. Hi, Shannon, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm happy to be here. So um, as you said, I am the program manager for events in the city. And as such, I have been working with our um, emergency management team, our safety management team, the uh, COVID enforcement team for Washington County. And we've come up with some COVID events guidelines that are based on the CDC and OHA protocol. It's really in depth and uh, I can share it with Beth and she can share it with you if you would like it later, but I will save you from going through all of those details and just give you kind of the top four highlights from it, which are um, limiting the number of participants at events to whatever the maximum capacity for the risk level in Washington County is at the time of the event. We're doing this through controlled entry and exits. We are doing time ticketing of some of our events so that people don't have to wait outside and wait for a time that they can get in. And of course, we're doing masks and social distancing. So those are the major things to keep in mind, which I'm sure most of you already are aware of. Um, we've also decided to adjust our event planning this year to better serve the community by offering modified in-person events. Last year, we pivoted and went online with a lot of virtual events, and we found that people just have Zoom fatigue now. And there's starting to be a tepid response to virtual events. And so we would like to have opportunities for people to see one another in person as safely as possible. So some of the highlights of the events we're doing this year, uh, coming up on March 20th, so next weekend, 
Um, we'll be doing the Kurdish New Year celebration, which will be our first 2021 in-person event. And so please feel free to join us at the round from one to three for that. We've also decided to do a small event series rather than some of our more traditional events. Um, we have canceled the Beaverton celebration parade, picnics in the park and flicks by the fountain. And we'll be replacing those with smaller, more frequent events so that we can have people in person and have it still stay safe with the COVID guidelines. We are doing something similar with THPRD for our Independence Day celebration. We'll be doing some family friendly activities throughout that weekend that people can be involved with. Um, this year, Beaverton Night Market will be returning in person in August, so we're very excited about that. It, of course, will look a little bit different because there will be COVID guidelines being followed. We will have ticketed, timed ticketing for entry, and it will be a controlled entry type of situation. Um, we're hoping to do volunteer fair in September. We'll see how that goes and how those folks want to do that. And we are optimistic that we'll be able to do the tree lighting ceremony again this year. And we're excited for that too. There's other events that we're planning to offer, but they are in the early stages of planning. So I'll kind of keep those to myself for now. But um, yeah, very excited. And hopefully we can collaborate with some of you on stuff. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer anything. Jane. Jane, yeah, I have a question. Hi, Shannon. Thank you for that update. Um, sure. I would want to talk about the Zoom fatigue because Beth mentions that um, phrase a lot uh, when we ask about, you know, why things are canceled. And I just wanted to know, did you, how did you um, come to that resolution that people are having Zoom fatigue? Because what we heard from Melissa Riley was that they had over a thousand, they reached over a thousand participants with their online activities. And I just want to know, did you do a survey? And if you did, who did you survey? And um, wh where did you get the data for that? So Zen City is um, contracted by the city of Beaverton and they do regular updates. They have 163 data points from online sources that are city specific. They look into those and tap on trends and find out what engagement looks like, how many impressions things are getting um, and whether or not people seem to be engaging with uh, virtual events and things that are posted. And they've seen a vast decline in that. Um, also, reading Eventbrite articles, uh, those are all saying that the virtual events are probably going to be far less attended now, and they've started to see that happening. Um, there are some events like conferences and things like that that have successfully made the switch to the virtual forum, but as a general rule, something that people don't have experience with in the past as something that they typically go to, if it's a new experience, there's a lot less engagement going on with that too. There's also just an oversaturation in the market right now of virtual things that people can do, and people are far more likely to do small virtual events like classes and things that are on demand than they are to do collective community events that are like webinar and Zoom with types of interaction for that. So we have been following studies and you know, using survey data from Zen City and then talking also with other event planners from other counties too. And it just seems to be the trend and the, the conclusion that we've come to. And yeah. this is a trend in the arts specifically or just in? No, overall, the events overall. overall. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you I for just, that. And I wanted to clarify something for Shannon because she probably wasn't sure what you were referring uh, to as far as Melissa's events. She's with the Beaverton Civic Theater and she presented earlier and she was talking about the classes and the craft activities that they were doing online. Um, could yeah. you just speak to how classes might be a little different than other types of events? So the classes are different and we are still seeing people engage in those types of things a lot. That's not something that the city typically offers because it, it does cater to such a small group of people. But um, those are things that people do seem to still be interested. Like I said, things that are smaller groups and don't require interaction with large groups of people online are more appealing. Things that are on demand and can be done in someone's own time are typically more appealing. 
Um, and we are finding that people will sign up for things if people that friends or family who don't live in the same place also do it. And so people are finding that online is a way to share events with one another if they're distance from each other. Okay. So that's cool. Yeah, very cool. I was actually talking about the detective workshops and the Cinderella theater, where she said um, the Cinderella theater went global, which I was really impressed with. And then the, the detective workshops reached over a, a thousand participants. So I thought those were great numbers for, you know, doing something different, mixing it up a bit and uh, involving families and young children. So, but thank you for your, um, for the data points on that. Sure. Sharon. Shannon, hi. <laughs> nice hey, to see uh, you. Nice to see you too. Um, just a quick question. Um, I know that BCCI has um, kind of wrangled with the, um, the event for Volunteer Fair, which has always been an in-person event. And I think we've pretty much come to the conclusion that we would rather go in-person than mm -hmm. as a virtual. So I think we're leaning toward that. And it is kind of that fatigue in a sense, but it also is how you get your best bang for the buck. And yeah. in person for that, for sure, I think is where we're leaning. Thank you. Yes, my team did a lot of brainstorming about that as well and what we might be able to do virtually. And really, yeah, for volunteer stuff in person is really where it's at. So I'm glad that it's looking like we'll be able to do that in September. Mm -hmm. So yay. Another reason that we have canceled some of the um, larger events is just because it takes six to eight months actually to plan some of those events. So we have already started hearing from people that they are sad that we canceled the celebration parade so soon and projections are positive. So why did we make that decision now and not hold off? But that's because the process for planning of the celebration parade actually should have started last month. So we put it off until March 9th is our drop date of the final date that we had to make the decision of whether or not we could get all of the planning done in order to do the parade this year. And we just don't have enough solid information about whether or not things are going to be in person. And we'd have to decide the parade route dependent upon how many people could be there. And we have no idea. And so we just aren't able to do that one this year. And it's similar with many of the other big events too. It just takes a lot longer than you would expect to plan something. Um, and I can share a planning timeline with you if you wanted to see that, but <laughs> yeah. Just a quick comment I, uh, about the prior subject around Zoom fatigue. There's an article uh, that Stanford put out from their research um, program on that, and I'm sending it in the chat if anybody's interested in just looking at you know what they found. Thank you. Yeah. That's great, and I'm going to copy it right now, <laughs> and I will read that. And I'll also put my email in there, too, in case anybody has any questions and wants this, to get in touch with me later. This research came out in February, so just last month. So okay. It's very current. Excellent. Thank you, Lynn. Shannon, I had a question. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the info. Um, I do think uh, some of us would find a planning timeline useful um, for information okay. uh, when we're thinking about arts events moving forward. Uh, my other question is on hybrid events. Um, mm -hmm. So as we return to in-person, uh, I think the virtual component um, is really great in that it creates more accessibility for a lot mm -hmm. of people. Uh, do, do you or, or the events department have any thoughts on, on hybrid events? 100% with you. Loving that it creates accessibility. And we're also very aware that not everyone's going to feel comfortable going to in-person events. And so we will be having a hybrid component to as many of the events as we can. And that'll be either um, live streaming videos, online activities, webinars, um, online panels for people to talk to. So we do have plans to augment our in-person events with online components so that people can still participate in those. And I would recommend that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's great. And I think that's one of the good things that has come from COVID is that we've been able to reach some audiences who otherwise wouldn't be able to attend events and are able to online. So we do want to continue that too. Good. Glad to hear Yeah. That. Does anyone else have any uh, questions on, on events? 
So the event timeline that I was talking about, I was just going to share with you what the timeline for the um, parade is to give you an idea of that. But if you want me to come up with a like a blank timeline for you for events and have that sent your way, I can do that too, if that's what you meant. Um, I, I, I think either, um, if we could see the parade as an actual, you know, hard example that's happening and also a general timeline so that we know um, when we are thinking about the future, um, what does the pipeline process need to look like? I think that would be helpful for us. Sure, Thanks. let me share my screen. Okay, here you go. So, oh, I might've moved it away from you. This is the work plan for um, the parade. The things that I've highlighted in this like beige color, um, those are things that all require more than six months of advance time in order to get it done. So all of our budgeting stuff happens about eight months in advance of when the parade would be. Um, all budgeting happens for the city in, uh, we turn in our budgets in February. There is another chance later on where we can do supplemental budgets if needed, but um, the arts budget will have been asked for already and then you don't find out whether or not it's actually approved until June. Um, the things that I have highlighted in this light green color, all the things that need to be done two to three months in advance, a lot of the things that you'll see that wind up needing to be done in advance are the marketing pieces and that's because we have a small marketing department for the entire city and so the ask of their time is really large and it's a really big lift for them to do and so it takes quite a while for turnaround as far as getting any kind of marketing um, made and then being able to submit it, print it and have it put online or distributed to the community and all that stuff is usually a time consuming process. One of the other things that is really time consuming is if you need to do an RFP, so a request for proposal, or you do, um, I think, what are they called? Uh, you do artists requests. I forget what you said that they were. Yeah, we do uh, typically for art events or for art uh, public art projects, we do an RFQ, um, a request for qualifications. Um, for, for BAM, um, you know, people submit a portfolio and the call is open for about three months um, and then assembling a selection panel. Um, it takes about seven or eight months to plan out BAM in advance. That's the art show at, that's the art show at the, at the library. Got it, right. So very similar to the RFP process that the events team typically does, but you plan for about two to three months if you have to do an open call to get some kind of outside resource for that. Um, and then, you know, there are just so many things you can't start planning until you get all of those things out of the way. Um, another thing to take into consideration is the actual schedule that the rest of the city has. I mean, this is just the events team schedule. Uh, November is a really good month for, for planning events. <laughs> There's not a whole lot going on in November. So if you are looking for some kind of event that you wanna do, November is one to shoot for and you won't have a lot of um, competition there as far as competing for time and uh, marketing. But I can uh, send you a event timeline planning Thing as well thank you for your own uses yeah i think we'd appreciate that thank you and, sure. and um i noticed on um on the chart you had just shown us you had paint in the park listed mm -hmm. uh, could you tell us about that since that's arts related and uh <laughs> I, I have not heard of that yet yeah so um if you keep it to yourselves for now because we haven't put it out into the public <laughs> But what we're trying to do is work on creating a series, a paint in the park series for probably June. And so for the four Saturdays that happen in June, we would have a small painting event that would be outside in a park, similar to a paint and sip, we're thinking, where you would have the instructor mic'd up and then they would everyone would paint the same image and they would walk them through how to do their painting. Of course, if people want to be there but paint something else, they're welcome to do that as well. 
but uh, we would provide easels, canvas, uh, paint brushes, paints, everything really. And people could just sign up, come to the event, have a nice painting experience in nature with other living people around them. <laughs> Hopefully have a good time with that. So um, that is part of one of the small event series things we're trying to do. Yeah, we have some other art stuff we're hoping to do as well, but need to confirm some stuff before I share more about those with you. But I think I'll be seeing y'all in the future. <laughs> we hope so as the Arts Commission, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions or comments for Shannon uh, or for arts events uh, or um, how, how her department uh, relates to the commission? Do you have any questions about COVID event stuff and how that's affecting things? It looks like we do have a question from uh, from Jeep. Jeep, go ahead. Uh, it sounds like you uh, organize quite a few of the events here in our. Uh, I assume you're speaking of Library Park and the Fountain Park uh, when you're when you're uh, talking about the events that are happening. Since you said Beaverton uh, Night and whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, with with that, uh, obviously, there's uh, I'm not familiar with the timeline of when the, the fountain project is uh, about to be done. Um, but is, is that uh, the fountain project and everything that's going on with that, is that going to work into the timeline of the events that you're hoping to be able to provide in the future? It won't be factored into the timeline, but it is being factored into the location. So City Park is just flat out closed for the summer um, because they will be doing that fountain renovation. And then also it probably won't be safe to open the fountain when it's ready to go. So we'll probably have to wait for that till next year. So we are looking at offering events. We're working with THPRD to find parks in different neighborhoods, which is also one of the goals of our event team is to have our events occur not just in central Beaverton, but in other neighborhoods as well, so that they're more accessible to a broader spectrum of our community. So we are going to work with THPRD to find locations that will work well for the various events that we are hoping to do. Um, we're also hoping to do like a spooky trail walk and we're trying to work with the Experience Theater Project to put something like that together, family-friendly Halloween thing. Um, so like those are some of the things that are in the works but aren't confirmed yet so we're not really publicly talking about them much <laughs> except to you now you all know more than everybody but yeah are there any additional thoughts or questions okay well thank you shannon uh for joining us tonight we appreciate it um since this commission advises the city on the arts, please continue to loop us in um, and seek our advisement um, as you're planning this. And if, are there any opportunities uh, in your current planning process where, where commissioners could provide feedback while you're making decisions? I'm working a little bit with Beth on some things right now. We aren't quite to the point where we're ready to come to you at large, but there are two things that I'm working on that we might collaborate with you on. And then if any of you have event ideas that you want to collaborate with the events team on, we're happy to do that too. We're trying to do more collaborations now going forward um, with boards and commissions and community organizations and just kind of make a larger connection but network between everybody and what it is that we're offering the community. Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Everybody have a great evening and I hope to see you and work with you soon. Thank you. Thanks, bye. All right, so next on the agenda is the Beaverton Arts Commission Award. So this is a proposal I have for the commission I feel that one of the most important ways we can advance the arts is to foster the next generations of upcoming artists uh, so that our arts ecosystem can continue to grow and flourish. 
uh, many of you probably don't know that my very first encounter with the Beaverton Arts Commission was in high school. And I was a high school student who uh, was very fortunate to receive the Beaverton Arts Commission Award. So that was a um, award recognition program that the commission and uh, city at that time uh, was implementing in their commission work. And it was uh, purely based on nominations that the commission received. There were several categories. There were um, outstanding achievement uh, in the arts for high school students, middle school students, um, I believe there was also an, an outstanding arts educator category. And uh, it was a really nice surprise to receive this letter that I was um, nominated to receive it. Uh, the recipients were recognized at a city council meeting. We received these amazing certificates, which I still have. <laughs> and uh, we uh, were able to meet the mayor and city council and I feel it was such a, um, it was a really great way for the city to show that the arts are supported and celebrated and, um, and that that's uh, an integral part of, uh, of what we do here. So as we know, the Beaverton Arts Commission Award uh, doesn't exist currently in our makeup. So my proposal to you all is that we revive it and bring it back, uh, bring it back into what we do. I think that we, um, we, can, can, we can discuss uh, later down the road um, about you know, do, doing a full on um, awards process. But for right now, uh, just to simplify things, uh, since we're now in March and the school year is ending in June. What I'm proposing to you right now is a very pared down simplified version uh, of this award. So I am proposing that uh, we do a call for nominations for high school seniors um, who have demonstrated out, outstanding achievement in the arts. This is performing arts and visual arts. So this would simply be a letter um, that goes out to all of the high school principals and then they can distribute to their faculty uh, as they see fit. And we would be asking for a maximum of two student nominations. Uh, so two total, um, it can be visual or performing arts. Those schools would email back their student nominations um, just with a brief, um, a very, very, brief statement of why they're nominating those students. And I think that we could ask for those nominations to be received back by the end of April. So that um, that gives more than a month uh, for schools to think about who they would want to nominate. And then we could vote on approving the nominations at our May meeting. And uh, that time that lines up nicely with the end of the school year and those recipients could be recognized at a June city council meeting. And uh, to be clear, um, we wouldn't be asking for any budget requests um, for this simplified version. Um, if we could uh, give our recipients a certificate, <laughs> Um, and another nice uh, component was that the Oregonian and um, other local newspapers like the Beaverton Valley Times did do write-ups um, that the Beaverton Arts Commission was, uh, you know, holding these awards and here are the recipients. Um, but I think it's, this is something very feasible and very doable that, that we can do and we can do it right now. Um, and it's, it's something that has uh, a beneficial lasting impact. Um, and uh, I would love to see what your all's thoughts are um, on, on moving forward in this direction. Lynn, I see a yeah, hand. Yeah, I have some initial ones and it's a, kind of a heads up. So um, I love this idea. Um, I was the recipient of um, uh, scholarships every year in my high school when I was um, from junior high all the way through high school, which got me into college um, because 
though it was uh, for private lessons. Um, and that was a really big deal. And the heads up part of it that I'd like to just really raise is that um, this suggests that the principals get the notification, the principals hand it down then to the teachers, the teachers then make the nominations. But I'd like to propose that we take it a little a step further and um, open it um, to maybe we stay with high school seniors, but that we open it to a more, you know, any, that anyone could nominate someone. And here's why. Um, there are lots of kids that are not in um, arts programs in their schools. And the teachers don't even know that they do art of any kind, whether it's performing art or visual art. And I have a very specific example of a young man who is a high school senior, and I'm sure Jeep knows who he is, Andrew Matthews. Um, and I imagine that he is not in a music program at school, and he is a, an absolute phenomenal guitar player. And he's taken lessons at Five Star Guitars. Um, really strange that Jeep just happens to be on the call. Like we've never even met before. He probably has no idea who I am. Um, but I, it, that's just one example that I know of, of a young person who I think he is a high school senior. He's 17 years old. Um, and he's actually been picked up by Paul Reed Smith Guitars and featured as one of the like rising stars. So to, um, to limit it, to only the schools, um, I think limits the opportunity for other, for, for, for young kids who are artists um, to be recognized. So I would, I would suggest that, you know, we, we broaden that um, reach. Sure. Thank you for that comment. Um, so, so to be clear, I'm only suggesting um, the, the solicitation of recommendations or nominations, excuse me, from directly from schools only because of the short time frame just for this school year. Of course, looking ahead to academic year 2021-2022, um, of, of course, we would have a long time to plan and broaden um, all of the different components of of fleshing out an awards program. The only reason I am suggesting we do a much more um, simplified version of this is, is only just because um, of the timing. And I, I think it's important that um, if we can do something feasible um, and, and if we can do it in a, a shorter simplified version, um, then why not? If it means that we can actually get something done for this year and we can actually get something out the door. Yeah, and, you know, a couple of other thoughts that come to mind about, about broadening it. I understand your like single channel approach. Um, and I, I get why that's, um, that could help sort of drive it to be happen faster. Um, but we could do simple things that don't cost any money. Um, having it announced on programs like AM Northwest, have Helen Raptus, you know, really promoted on TV, that's free. Um, have it promoted in the newspaper as a public service announcement, that's free. Um, have the music stores be notified um, through, uh, you know, just outreach and outreach effort. Um, you know, I, I would hate to see <clears throat> that there are kids that are phenomenal um, and they're high school seniors and they missed the opportunity because their teachers had no idea that they were an artist of any kind. Um, I thank you for that. Um, I see some other hands, uh, Destry. Um, yeah, so I, I totally get what both of you are saying. And um, Allison, I guess with your point of, of timing, that's assuming. Oops, you muted yourself, Destry. I'm sorry. Um, do, uh, Allison, I'm assuming with your timing, you're meaning um, by the end of the school year in June rather than the end of 2020. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. So we're talking about uh, this current school year. And so we only have three months. Um, right. Okay. Yeah. So a, a way, I guess, on, on then flexing the schedule, because I definitely see like the relevance of the timing is could we potentially open it um, with a longer timeline of 18 or, or younger? And then that kind of loosens the restriction of the school year if they're 18 um, ongoing, because I do think 
with with time, it would be difficult, especially with the potential number of um, Apple or nominees that would come in to have that in reasonably and advertised and go through that by June, um, or maybe two different um, like ongoing. But I, I don't want people that have lived this kind of awful 2020 to then miss out on being a part of this because of the time crunch. And I think it is really important. And I know how I would have valued something like this in high yeah. school. Um, so that's just, I guess, a possible idea that I had. Um, Destry, I'm not sure I understand when you said open it up uh, to under 18. Can you, are, are you? Um, rather than just high school seniors, if it was, I mean, if we had like as 18 as a gap, because that's when you're graduating high school, typically you're 18. So maybe if it was like 17, 18, which would also, I guess, open it up to juniors to some extent, but that also, um, in my experience as a junior, can be very monumental to have that for colleges. It's more important what you're getting junior year than June as you're graduating. That's not really, I mean, it is personally great, but um, this is something you could definitely put on a college application. So maybe having it 17, 18 year olds in the year is a way to work through both of those challenges. Sure, and I think um, moving, if, if we're talking about next school year, I think definitely having multiple age categories um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and broadening it in, in that scope, um, of course makes sense because we have a long, a long time to plan that. Um, I'm, I'm just suggesting high school seniors, um, we could even do juniors and seniors, but the reason I'm suggesting um, that again is is just because of the timing we're looking at with this school year um, and also building in time um, you know logistical things lining up in a city council meeting um, certificates and, and the other administrative stuff that would go into that right but if the school year ended in june that's why i was i was saying this as if it's 17 and 18 year olds it wouldn't have to be june it could be sorry my dog um it could be later like like even august i think would give it more more time that was kind of where i was going with the suggestion i, I totally get what both of you are saying um I was just trying to find it somewhere in the middle because yeah. I think both elements are important. You're making a really good point about juniors and seniors because of applying for colleges. I didn't even think of that. Um, so that's an interesting, an interesting consideration. Peg, I see your hand also. Yeah, I have a question. I, I love the idea. I think it's a wonderful thing to do. The one thing I haven't heard is, has anybody talked to people in the school system to see how realistic this is to happen given all the things that all the teachers and administrators are dealing with right now, is this something else that they can take on, that they can take on and make happen in a time frame that's gonna work for us? Because I suspect that there's not a whole lot of time to do this from their standpoint. Sure. That's, that's my question. Have you talked to them, anybody about that? So my thinking along those lines is, uh, of course we know everyone has a lot on their plate, but even, um, even if we only got 50, a 50% 50 response rate and we um, had 10 nominations come in, I feel that something is better than nothing um, instead of us you know, waiting a whole um, um, extra year for us to get something out the door. Um, to me, it seems like if we can give something out, um, even if not everyone responds just for this year, um, I, I feel that that's, um, a step forward and a step in the right direction. I, I see your point. I'm thinking if I'm a, a college senior or a high school senior and I've been working really hard at what I do and I love it and, and then I find out there's an award that I never heard about because my school didn't tell me about it. Yeah, it's not the end of my life, obviously, but it, I love the idea. I just don't want to see, can't find a nicer way of saying it. it uh, done less uh, less than as it well might be done. Didn't come out right, but anyway, thanks, uh, thanks Peg, right. for the for the feedback. And um, the other hand I see is April. Hi. Well, speaking as a teacher, yeah, we're like so stressed and busy right now. Um, and like something similar, like right now I'm working on getting recommendations for students who are moving into middle school to do the AVID program, right? 
And that just takes a lot of time and consideration. And we need to know what the criteria are. So if you're gonna send this to the principals, they have to have clear criteria. And I don't think we've made that yet. So I feel like that this is a great idea and I love it. Um, and if we're gonna give an award though, we have to make sure that it has the meaning behind it so that we know what the criteria are so that we can communicate that clearly and what the students um, who are getting this award have demonstrated. Um, and when you have so many different artists from so many different disciplines, it's gonna be really hard to narrow it down to two. And then you could get infighting between the different teachers and the different departments advocating for their students. And it could be tricky, it, but I love the idea. And that's why I think widening the net, I think makes sense. And um, I love the idea. And I think that would be great if we could talk about it more moving forward. I just don't know if this year might be the most feasible. Thanks for the input. Thank you, Jim. Um, yeah, maybe a little history that um, maybe the awards went away back when we took on scholarships and, um, and now we've given away the scholarships, the foundation is handling our students. So to bring these awards back in and recognize our students is an amazing idea. I think we should move it forward. Understand that this year is a little ambitious uh, what Destry said about uh, the difference in scholarships versus award, that this is something that students really might want to use to bolster college applications. So juniors should be included in that. Um, but, um, you know, it's going to take a little time to iron out, but it's an amazing idea. We should get back into uh, getting involved with all the incredible artists and students that are in, in Beaverton. Um, so, we should move it forward, but uh, this year is going to be a push. Thanks for the feedback, Jim. Ryan, you also have a hand. Yeah, I was just going to echo um, uh, the concerns uh, with the timing. I think the idea is absolutely fantastic and needed, and we should be doing this um, uh, as a part of what we do. Um, uh, I, I can't agree with that more. Um, but um, as as an old teacher, um, uh, I would echo uh, the fact that they need clear clear criteria um, to um, uh, determine uh, how to nominate someone because it takes more time when you're given less, um, uh, especially dealing with students. Also, this time of year. Um, uh, for teachers and the number of recommendations that they're giving out and the end of the year programs that they're trying to put together and um, all of that sort of stuff. It, it really weighs um, a lot, um, on, uh, especially you know, with teachers that are co-curricular, which are generally your arts, your theaters, your um, choirs, your bands, your, um, you know, those types of things. Um, it, uh, it, uh, it's really hard um, uh, to to get that, and I think when you're launching something like this, because really, even though it's been done before, it's really a launch, and you want to make sure that it gets launched really well, so that it sticks around and it gets a positive vibe from the get go. Um, and um, and to be honest, uh, uh, as someone right now who's you know I I used to teach, but right now I do construction for schools, and um, it's hard for me to get a response from a principal um, and I'm building their school and I'm building their office, you know, um, uh, for simple questions, you know, um, and, and it's really just because they're flooded and things are changing daily for them, whether it's coming down from the state or whether it's coming down from their school board because of COVID, there's a lot of stuff going on and a lot of stuff that's being missed. And I would hate for something uh, such great as this to be missed as a missed opportunity. Um, I would also add that um, rather than being at the end of the year to award something like this, it, it's probably better in the first, um, by the end of the first quarter or by the first half, like the semester of a year, um, mainly because of what people have been saying about colleges. This is really good information. If you win an award like this, it's really great for those college resumes. And it's, it's something that we can provide them free of charge, a certificate saying, hey, thanks for your um, 
uh, for your efforts in the arts and um, the city's recognizing you. It's a great thing for students to be able to use, but at the end of the year, a lot of people that would win those awards, especially if it's limited to just seniors or just juniors, they may have missed that opportunity to apply for those things. Um, so yeah, I think it's a great, we should be on it. Um, and I think it's a great opportunity to start planning it um, to be released or um, to be recognized for the beginning, uh, like the first half of the school year next year, but um, it's really tight right now. Thanks for the feedback. Uh, Jane's giving me the, the, yeah. the pain. I, I'm just wondering, since there's so many people that have something to say and there's been a lot of great uh, feedback, maybe um, we could uh, have a subcommittee. It sounds like people wanna do it, but let's not rush and do it halfway. Let's put a lot of thought and maybe roll something out for the next school year. I know, Allison, you're so passionate about it, but it sounds like the feedback for teachers and just you know doing it the right way. Maybe we have a subcommittee talk about it and maybe put some criteria together and then come back to the next meeting um, and we can discuss it a little more since we're over time. And Sure, I, I think that sounds great. Um, thanks, Jane, for reminding us about the time. I really appreciate that. Thanks to everyone for your feedback um, and, and for listening to the proposal. Uh, I appreciate it. All right, so moving on um, is the review of the Arts Commission bylaws. Um, thank you, Beth, for sending that out to everyone. Um, just to point out a couple things, uh, Jane and I um, were asked to meet with Beth and Lanny Parr. Uh, yesterday and Lanny just wanted to um, briefly uh, give us an overview of uh, what happened with the bylaws. She did want to ex extend her sincere thanks to the commission um, uh, for our subcommittee's really hard work uh, on the bylaws um, a year or so ago. So thank you to that subcommittee again. And she also wanted to extend her uh, gratitude in our patience, since she knows and acknowledges that we've been waiting um, for a while uh, for our bylaws to be updated. Um, she updated us that pretty much everything that had been submitted to her from our subcommittee did uh, transfer over into uh, this new template. Um, and the new template that they are using is because of the, uh, the new city charter. Um, so there wasn't really any uh, substantive content that uh, needed to be changed. Um, the other point was that you may have noticed that there's no longer a, um, in the bylaws, the residency requirement for commissioners isn't included here. However, it is still included in city code. Um, so there is a, uh, a residency requirement and, or preference for uh, members of boards and commissions. And if there are non-resident applications, um, all of city council needs to approve those uh, applicants and a board or commission can have up to 15% um, of their members be non-residents. So she just wanted to uh, let us know about that. Uh, and for the timeline, uh, we will need to vote on a final draft at our um, in April. And then it will go to city council in May or June around that time frame. So that's what we're looking at. Hopefully everyone had a chance to look at the bylaws. Are there any questions or um, any issues anyone would like to raise? Ryan? Uh, so I was, uh, so last time Beth mentioned that um, the bylaws that were listed in the 2021 um, BAC board handbook um, uh, was the adapted or changed um, uh, by bylaws that we're waiting on. Are those the bylaws that um, uh, just transitioned into the format of um, 
of uh, what was sent out uh, yesterday. Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand your question. Can you repeat that? Yeah, so in the 2021 um, BAC board handbook, um, there's the listing of the bylaws. Uh, last meeting, Beth indicated that those, um, that that was actually the revised one that everyone was waiting to get approved of from the board. Um, and, um, and then uh, we got the updated one um, from um, base, the, the reformatted one um, the in, in PDF form. Um, is, is the one from the handbook the one that was translated into um, the reformatted, uh, yes. my understanding? Of yes, Th that is correct, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, the, the, more, the most current version of the bylaws that were done by the Beaverton Arts Commission, which I had already incorporated in the handbook. Um, so we were essentially operating under those, even though they hadn't been adopted by council. Those were translated into this current version um, that was dictated by the charter change. Okay. Um, I did just want to kind of highlight um, some things. I wasn't a part of anything before that, but I did review between the two um, and under article three duties, um, there were um, there were seven original duties and, and, and the new ones down to five. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I was just wondering about that. And then um, the other one was about meet, meeting format. Um, sorry, just scrolling here. Um, <coughs> Uh, it says uh, uh, that the visitor comment period, um, uh, uh, yada, yada, it has the same language, but it added shall not exceed five minutes, which, which I don't disagree with um, um, per se, but I wanted to understand what the definition of visitor is that, is that someone that's just showing up to the meeting or is that like our guest speakers we asked to come um, do, you know, because um, uh, five minutes is a little short for, um, people if we're asking them to present so yeah. um, it just wasn't I, clear to me so i'd be happy to jump in and answer those if that's okay um so the the article three the seven duties going down to five we did talk to lanny about that um she was trying to make it concise but one of the points that she explained to us that hopefully will address that concern um is that in a lot of ways it's better to have the bylaws be broad um because then we don't have to go back to city council with changes if we change a policy or we change a program or have a, have a different goal or a different focus. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, one of the duties is to promote and strengthen participation and awareness by bringing people together to experience arts and culture. That's a very broad statement, correct? We wouldn't want to put in the bylaws um, the Arts Commission conducts three signature events every year. They partner with the night market because if we decide not to do that or a pandemic happens <laughs> or whatever. Um, so I think I hope that having it be very broad um, actually in captures everything that the commission was hoping. Um, and then the five minute one, yeah, that's really for anyone that we don't agendize. So um, yeah. I don't know if they'll end up keeping that in the template after it's reviewed by the city attorney, um, but I can I can get that answer back to you. Certainly get an answer back to you about that before the next meeting. Or Beth, I'm wondering, maybe we bring it up to Lonnie because um, to Ryan's point, does visitors mean public comment? And if we just understand that, um, we might have to change some language there, but that might be something we bring up to Lonnie. That's a great point. Yeah, I'll write that down. Yeah, it doesn't reflect on guest speakers. They're not limited by no. any type of. Yeah, it just wasn't clear to me. So I was like, oh. Yeah, yeah, how, yeah exactly. Yeah, I think that's one of the things we need to make clear. And uh, just just one last uh, comparison comment that I had, um, or actually it's not a comparison because it um, went through, but uh, there is the language under Article 5, Officers, uh, 3 Duty, A Chair. Um, uh, they use the word shall for um, Roman numeral five there, um, represent the board to the public and may give um, presentations and provide testimonies. The word shall technically means that they're the only representative that can represent the board. 
um, yep. and which I don't necessarily disagree with, um, um, but it's always nice for the chair to have the opportunity to delegate whenever they want Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's a, that opportunity. So. That's a great point. I will add that. That's all. So April, would be, also, oh, would that be changed from shall to may or adding adding clarity is that uh, i don't disagree with the word shall as long as um they add in the opportunity for them to delegate um that task to somebody to someone cool. else on the board um right. whether the situation requires it or the topic requires it or you know whatever um uh you know uh uh if there's an accident and and uh and elson can't make uh the board meeting you know the vice chair uh, is written in there that they can jump in but i'm more talking about you know maybe it's a topic that that Allison doesn't want to talk about that uh, she thinks that um you know like jim can talk more about you know then you know it'd be nice for her to say just go talk to them about it so, so representative or designee or designee yep mm -hmm. Yeah, I will make a note of that and I will relay that to Lanny and our city attorney. That's all I have. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. April, you have a question also or comment? Yeah, my only comment was in reviewing it. Um, I didn't see any mention of, you know, like um, diversity or inclusion or elevating, you know, voices, um, that kind of language in there, which it's, you know, arts and culture. But, you know, I feel like um, I know the city is working towards trying to look at things through an equity lens. And I feel like as an arts um, commission, we should also be making sure that when we're advocating for arts and culture, that we're inclusive of, um, you know, our community that we represent. So I feel like some sort of addition just to just to add that into one of the duties, I think would be really helpful um, to make sure that we're considering that when we're considering all of the things that we're doing. Yeah, I just want to make, I, Jimmy probably remember and Sharon, we did put a lot of diversity pieces in there. So maybe they did get cut out, but um, I think it's a good point. Yeah, we did. I, I didn't think that it was something that we needed to mandate. It's just yeah. something that might have been given, you know, in the process. Right. But, but Beth, you'll follow up with Lanny on that. and. Yeah, I absolutely will. I, I think our, in particular, our cult, cultural inclusion program would love to hear that you've mentioned that, April. Um, you know, I, um, it, whether or not we can get in the bylaws, I don't know. I think it's a great idea personally, and I would love to add something about that in there. And I think they probably wouldn't be a problem. Um, I, but I would also just add that, you know, this commission certainly is empowered to come up with your own, you know, statements of intent or equity. Uh, policy or um, the, the city code actually empowers the arts commission to develop policy. So, uh, for example, in the last uh, city that I worked in, um, the, we developed an equity and inclusion statement of intent um, with the arts commission. So, um, while I agree that having it in the bylaws is probably very important and appropriate, if for some reason um, they don't want to include that, um, I think we can get at that another way. Um, but I will definitely raise it with um, Lanny and with the city attorney. Does anyone else have any further thoughts or comments on the bylaws? Okay, it doesn't look like it. Thank you again to our bylaws subcommittee who worked so hard on this. Um, and on that subcommittee was Jim, Jane, Mary Ellen, Sharon, and am I forgetting anyone else on that subcommittee? Laura was on it. Oh, right, yeah. Um, so many thanks to you all. Um, we really appreciate all the hard work and time you put into it, thank you. All right, so if there are no further questions and comments on that front, uh, we will move forward to um, the retreat planning. Can we pick a date for the BAC retreat? Um, so I, Beth, do you have any uh, updates on the doodle front? 
Oh, Beth, you're mute. You're muted. Sorry. Thanks. Yeah, I, I I was saying, let me refresh my screen and pull up the doodle poll. I can certainly pull it up and share it with everyone as well. So I, um, you know, someone on the planning subcommittee wants to talk about the rationale around wanting to do more than one day versus um, doing it all in one day or spacing it out. Um, but I essentially just threw, threw together a doodle poll for every sat almost every Saturday in April and May um, uh, to see how it fell out. And it looks like right now, the two dates that have 14 votes each. So that means um, we're missing one person that hasn't voted. Um, were April 10th and May 22nd. The, the, the next date down that has 13 votes is May 1st. Um, so we don't have, we have 15 commissioners. So it looks like we don't have all 15 available on either April 10th or, or May, May 22nd. The April 10th date, it looks like um, Shoshana wasn't available. And the other one, sorry, I just accidentally hit the wrong tab. And then the other one from May 22nd, it looks like um, uh, Shelly was not available that day. But the 14 other ones. And then of course, we'll also have to, you know, if we have guest speakers, we'll have to see if they're available and we may have to adjust some things if certain people aren't available, but. Sure. So, so we don't have a date that works for everyone, right? C currently, is that the where Correct. we stand? Um, so, is it possible uh, to kind of rethink uh, the scheduling plan and make our April fourteenth meeting uh, essentially an executive session slash retreat, since that is already on everyone's calendars? Is is that um, is that something I think that I'm trying to think I don't the only thing that that might be a business item that needs to be discussed um, is the downtown association has a mural project that they'd like to bring to the Commission for approval. Um, although I don't think that will take a large chunk of the agenda. Um, so, you know, the remainder could I, there's no reason it couldn't be. Okay, so so we could possibly do. Um, public business items at the beginning and then move into uh, executive mode. Okay, so that, that might be uh, an option, Jane? Uh, we would have to vote on the bylaws too at that April meeting. Oh, correct. Oh, right, okay. Yes, thank you. Um, Destry, you had a comment? Um, yeah, I know, um, I mean, I can't remember her name, but she's, she's not here tonight, but I know that there had been some discussion um, that in the past, or at least it was, she wanted um, specific, there'd been like that month's um, BAC meeting was was kind of canceled due to being at the retreat. So that kind of plays into using that meeting. Um, and I don't see why anyone who was on at least the committee planning this would have an issue with a couple of business items at the beginning. And I, I do like that that would be closer to the, the other date that was available. Um, I, I think having them almost a month or, or further apart kind of loses the the impact of the idea um, and, and conversations and keeping that going. The idea uh, behind splitting it into two days was having that first day of discussion and then having some time to think about it and things you'd like to bring back and having them too far apart almost seems like you've had too much time and now you've once again forgotten what you wanted to discuss. So I do think your suggestion would be ideal. Yes, I, um, I agree with you on the momentum uh, of it. And, um, and just, uh, just to let everyone know the reason, uh, one of the logistical reasons the, the two separate day um, proposal was put on the table was uh, so that we weren't all on Zoom looking at a screen for many hours on end. So it was kind of to break up that type of online monotony. Um, so that's that's one of the reasons behind that. But if, if a lot of people, um, uh, does anyone else have any additional thoughts that they want to put on the table about, about scheduling, Jim and, and Peg? Jim? Yeah, real quickly. Um, yeah, you, you, you nailed it, is that 
four hours of Zoom is brutal. And um, we did have at one point or once or twice where we did do this have in a, in a meeting. And if everything's focused and stay on point, you can pack a lot in two hours. And so I think that's a great idea to move it forward, uh, get it in April. Um, you don't want to push the, if we need a secondary meeting, you don't want to push it too far back, but let's jump on this. If April works, let's do it. And we can, we can get a lot done in two hours. Right. Another, um, uh, if, oh, sorry, Peg. Hey, hey. I was just looking for clarification. We're saying scrap to the idea of two separate days entirely, do it all in one two hour meeting as opposed to a two hour meeting on the 10th and a two hour meeting on the 15th. I, I'm getting some feedback on my end. I'm not sure if anyone else is hearing that. Is yeah, that hearing. people? Okay. Um, Peg, uh, can, you, can you repeat your comment for us, please? Yeah, I was just wanting to clarify whether we were doing to have two days separated by some amount of time, as in the 10th and the 14th, or we were saying, forget the two days, go for just the 14th. Um, I, I think, I'm, I'm not sure if we've totally decided, but I think it might make most sense um, in the spirit of, of finding a time that works for everyone. Um, I think the 14th makes the most sense since we already have that on our calendars. We could, um, another idea is if we could bump up our starting time to maybe six, um, if, if that works, I'm not sure. Um, and maybe Beth, maybe you could have some insight on that. Could we bump up our official meeting time to maybe six o'clock, uh, do our normal public business and then move into executive session and maybe we go uh, six to, maybe six to nine, you know, with, with a break in there. Um, and if we are efficient in our uh, planning, um, we could cover a lot of ground. And if, if there is anything lingering or a topic that doesn't fit, you know, we could definitely have that in our May meeting. Um, I, I think that might be the most efficient way to schedule at, at this point, since, uh, since scheduling with a large group is complicated. Um, well, how do people feel on that front? Does that seem, does that seem like a, I see Shelly's thumb up um, for April 14th, um, April 14th, and we try to just get everything done. Um, okay, I see a lot of thumbs up. Um, how do we feel about, uh, how do we feel about starting a half hour early at six? Just, I see some consensus. Um, and does any, does this not work for anyone? I guess, I guess being on the committee, I still had some um, I, idea that there was purpose to breaking it into two days. And I guess in what I was saying previously was to have one day on the weekend and then to also use the day um, of our general meeting. I think like the main point that I was making is, is to have time to discuss, not be stuck behind the computer. And I mean, just in, I mean, you watch how we are in these meetings, we're going over time right now on this. I don't think there's any way that we can have an effective retreat and really cover the ground in entirely by limiting it to, to one meeting. We have a lot of topics that people had a lot to say on and, and the having that divide and not just a break gives people that time to go, oh, I wish I'd said that. I mean, we all have those moments. And I think that's a really key part of these diversity and inclusion and um, outreach initiative discussions is to have a little bit of time, but not you know a month and a half either. And so I think that April 10th and April 14th dates would really meet um, what my expectations of the retreat were anyway, my understanding of what the committee wanted, but it depends on how everyone feels, so. Well, and I agree with Destry on that. Maybe it's because we're both new um, that we, you know, kind of want that extra processing time because I think that's really helpful. And also I'm pretty exhausted by now. Um, and I am on Zoom all day anyway. So by the end of the day, it's, it's really, uh, I'm really tired. So a weekend felt more like a retreat. Um, like, cause then I can start the day fresh, you know? So anyway, so I like the idea of like the 10th and the 14th, even though it's one more day to add on my calendar. Um, I think it's worth worthwhile. That's just how I feel. 
I didn't think we were taking the 14th and the 10th. I thought we were doing both days still, aren't we? Oh, the, I, my understanding was we were looking at just the 14th. Oh, I thought we were gonna do the 10th and the 14th, two hours each day. Because my understanding, my understanding is the 10th does not, still does not work for everyone. I, I think it's going to be really hard to find yeah. two dates that works for everyone and having 99% of the committee there versus just jamming it into one night. I, th I think, I mean, depending on everyone's opinions, I, I think that would still make sense. Or maybe someone can flex or, or figure it out when it's everyone but one person. I would echo the opinion on the floor. Um, yeah. yeah. Trying to get everything in um to a, a normal meeting time or down to three hours um you know while we still have business to do um will be challenging i also think that um, the committee talked about uh, being able to have time to digest information um and um, be able to set goals and stuff um, after having time to digest that information um uh, so, so I would still argue to um, have two phases of a retreat, um, phases for lack of a better word, I guess. Um, but if, if honestly we're having a hard time um, uh, grabbing an extra day on the calendar, I would recommend that maybe we just grab, um, uh, uh, use two general meeting dates, right? Do a short general meeting, um, do what's required by us. Um, uh, and and then get into it. Um, but I don't know what's on um, the May docket and we probably won't know what's fully on that till next month anyways. But um, uh, that would probably be the lesser um, uh, uh, preferred in my opinion, but, um, but it is something that allows people to be at it. I'm with Destry on this. I think that if we use the 14th and the 10th, as the two meetings, um, instead of trying to spread them out too far, like April and May, we're gonna be focused. We have time to breathe in between. We're not trying to cram everything together. And, um, you know, maybe, I mean, we're over time and I wanna be sensitive to that. Uh, maybe we go back to the subcommittee and talk a little about it and look at the agenda items, but it's really two full, I think we need two full um, opportunities to do that so if we go back to the subcommittee though then that that vote wouldn't come back in, until april which is our next meeting so really I, th I think we all kind of have to make a decision to tonight to have april 10th since it's march 10th and then the april um 14th meeting okay do you want to make a motion then destry is that oh, how right. we um, can we hear from shoshana yeah i mean i'm going out of town on the 10th that's why i said i can't make it so I mean yeah I understand that making I understand that it's very difficult to uh, schedule everyone's calendar but we have other dates that other people were available they were just less I mean I was just wondering um, I mean I really would like to be able to participate um, and I am a commissioner too so is is there another another time that day or, or should is there I'm out of town I'm like not I'm here. <laughs> So, and uh, oops, Beth, on um, on was there any other April date that had a had a lot of votes? Because th the other concern is um, we would like to have the retreat as soon as possible in our calendar year, um, so that we're not pushing it, bumping it out further down down the road. So that's also why we're we're zeroing in on right now. What about what it what about our meeting in the May twenty second meeting? I, I think that was our second most votes, right? Uh, yeah, and then in April the second uh, vote getter was April twenty fourth. It had twelve votes, and um, that the folks that couldn't make it were um, Jane. Let's see, sorry. I'm out of town, but I can try to figure out how Jim, I can make it. De Jim and Destry. I'm trying to figure out who we're missing on this. Uh, I'm sorry, what date was that that you just said? Sorry, April 24th. April 24th. I have a question for the group. Um, and it, it was my impression, and I don't, you know, because 
I was new starting last year. I don't know how retreats have happened in the past, but it was my impression that part of the uh, part of the purpose of the retreat was, you know, partly to kind of get to know each other and be able to kind of have some some of that interactive time to spend together so it seems like it defeats the purpose to try and slip it into a meeting uh, defeats that purpose now if that's not the purpose of it and we're just trying to get business done that's great i'm i'm all for whatever we need to do but i just wanted to raise that because that was my impression and i'll go with whatever the group is is most uh desiring yeah i'd, I'd like to speak to that because that's a good point lynn is that it, it seemed like a almost a better chunk of an hour in the beginning was that get to know you sort of thing. So, you know, understanding a situation where now, um, you know, if we want to, you know, get down to business and we throw that aside, that's a good hour off of it. If we take them two and a half hours and we focus on what we need to do and and, and get to the purpose, um, then it's, it's we can get a lot done. And if it's not satisfactory, then maybe at some point, very as, as soon as uh, people schedules will allow, we can add another meeting to it. But I, I think it's really hard right now, considering we haven't gotten more than 10 out of 15 people to agree on any date, that if we can use the first uh, opportunity being the next meeting to jump on this and get this agenda done, extend time a little bit, not have that we all need to do. You know, I want to get to know everybody, but you know, hopefully as soon as we can get back together again, that will happen. But let's, you know, you can knock this off and we don't have to extend it into two meetings or we don't have to. I mean, but let's get one in hand. And uh, like I said, we, we can, you know, in two and a half or three hours uh, utilize, you know, at our next meeting, we can get a lot done if we stay on track. Did, did we share out the agenda with the whole, with the whole group or just the committee? Okay. Yeah. So I don't even honestly think that there was like a chunk of time for getting to, to know each other, which, which maybe there also should be, because as a new member, I would appreciate that, but I don't think it, it was any substantial block that would make um, a, a difference other than kind of, you know, community building games at the end of different um, like programs, but it is, I mean, to me, it, it feels tight as it is. So I, I agree with Jim that in, in the essence of time um, and efficiency, I feel that we should move forward with um, looking at the April 14th date, since that does work for everyone um, at this time. And um, if, uh, if we add- Wait, wait, April 14th? That's our meeting. That's our oh, regularly oh, okay. scheduled okay. DAC time. I just want to, I just want to throw in just something to consider. Um, uh, you know, we probably can get most of the folks that we that you guys suggested on the agenda um, to come, but you know, there might need to be rearranging of um, the agenda if, for example, one of the, the guest speakers that you wanted to have come in isn't available. Um, I mean, I'm sure you're aware of that, but I there probably needs to be another subcommittee meeting um, after we determine the date to just make sure that the agenda still makes sense and and you know so so on. So, yeah, so. the other thing that's coming to mind, and because sorry to be, you know. Uh, particular, but uh, do we need to just ve verify that even though, because we have our meetings scheduled for the regular dates, um, but sometimes people can't make it and they just let someone know, hey, I can't make it. Do we need to, do we need to uh, sort of validate that everyone can actually make that date, like do a doodle for that thing or take a head count right now or whatever, like I can do it that date, but um, do we need to just make sure so that we're not saying we're doing it and then someone goes, oh, no, I was not available and I wasn't here tonight or something like that? Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure we, we need to uh, do a doodle for, um, for the 14th since those dates were already given to us. Um, uh, so. Okay, just checking. Thanks. Oh, we're all supposed to be available for the 
right this this that week so uh, there shouldn't be an issue and granted not everybody can make it but apparently it, no day is going to work so that seems to be the obvious way to move forward yeah <laughs> it sounds good so i I'm, I'm going to propose that we uh go with the 14th for right now we bump up the start time to the si to six o'clock um and that's what we're aiming for the first part of that uh will be any business that will be public and then we'll move into the retreat uh executive session uh portion so it won't be recorded it won't be open to the public um and then we can also discuss you know finding other times um to do the more um the more social aspects um, that we would typically experience in our in-person retreats, if, if maybe we can uh, work that in uh, at a later time that works for everyone. And I just wanted to just on the on public a note on public meeting law, um, I'll have to clarify whether or not we we can turn off the recording for the retreat part. Um, normally, the retreat would still be a public meeting. Um, we would still have to notice it as a public meeting. So we'll have to do that. You know, it's it's not typical for the public to show up at something like that, um, but we do typically have to make it open to the public. So I'm not com confident we can turn off recording. And so I just wanted to clarify that, but I'll get, I'll get a firm answer. Okay. Thanks, Ben. And, and please, uh, well beforehand, send us the subcommittee, the, you know, the agenda, if it changes from now till then, uh, or, you know, but send us forehand so we can come ready to roll up our sleeves and it could work. Yeah, of course. So we're way over time and I apologize being the timekeeper for that. Um, but <laughs> I don't know, Allison, what you Thank want you. to do. We still have one more thing and uh, we talked about um, creating a subcommittee for the arts award and I, I'm happy to make a motion for that. Um, but uh, what, do you, what do you want to do? It's 8.43. Oh, I, 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 think, um, I think we could table that uh, to when we have the larger subcommittee discussion. Um, I think that's fine. I, I don't think we need to, to vote on that right now. Um, but if we could move on uh, to Beth's staff liaison updates. Um, sure. Um, <laughs> I, I did send you all a, a bunch of emails the last couple of weeks with photos of the four public art pieces that are in process for uh, the RESER. Um, if you weren't able to open any of the photos, let me know. But we got some really beautiful photos of the insignia, which is the piece that was just installed at the uh, police department or public safety building. Um, and I sent out some great photos of Will Schlau's um, aluminum butterflies being delivered. Um, uh, Chris showed a photo of that on the north wall earlier, um, but we'll keep sending out those photos as we get them. Um, we're tracking just fabrication and installation and coordination for those four pieces, which, which um, is a lot of meetings with architects and um, project team and the artists um, to get all of those details ironed out. Um, and then I did want to plug the um, healing workshop tomorrow. Um, uh, this is part of the workshop series that we coordinate with um, Hillsboro and Tualatin Valley Creates. Um, tomorrow uh, at noon, um, you can join uh, How the Arts Can Help Us Heal and Overcome Difficult Times. Um, and actually, the two speakers were recommended by BAC members, um, or Mary Ellen Baker recommended Maria Huppie. And actually, Lynn, um, our own Lynn, uh, recommended Reverend Maya Massar. Um, Maria Huppy is a um, quadriplegic that has started um, doing um, mouth painting. And she has a really inspiring and amazing story. And she's also an amazing artist. Um, and then uh, Maya Massar um, is, uh, I I've never heard this term before, a facilitator and a shamanic and fine artist. So that's pretty impressive. Um, so at noon tomorrow, I'll send out a reminder link. Um, we do ask that people register through TVC, but um, Lynn, I got your message, so I'll, I'll send you a link. Um, and just a comment about yeah. Maya. I've heard her speak before. I, I know her well, but I've heard her speak before. She's an extraordinary speaker. 
and you know anyone who can relate to the topic, um, I I strongly and en uh, encourage you to 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 come if you can because she's pretty special. I'll send that up. Uh, I'll send that link out again to the whole group, um, and then just the, the the standard city updates that they want us to share with all the boards. Um, Mayor Lacey Beatty did the. Um, a virtual um, state of the city address on March 4th, um, which you can find on the city's website. Um, I'm not gonna just read these since we're over time. Um, <clears throat> there will be a special election in May, a special election to fill the vacant city council position number one, which we held on May 18th. The, the position is an elected at large to fill a partial term that expires December 31st, 2022. The uh, deadline for filing is Thursday, March 18th and you can find that information on the city's website. Um, there is a volunteer committee formed to discuss uh, naming the Public Safety Center's plaza um, and our own Sue Pike as a volunteer liaison from the Arts Commission on that project. But they're doing a survey and they're um, asking the public to submit their suggestions for, for the naming of the plaza. And they could be named after uh, a person and that could be a Beaverton resident, deceased or living, a tribal name or any other type of suggestion. Um, and they ask that you provide a detailed explanation as to why you're recommending that name. And again, you can find that if you go on the city's website and just do the search of, you know, public plaza and you should be able to find it. Um, and then um, council member uh, Laura Mitchell mentioned the uh, survey about what the public wants to see in the next city manager. Um, which I had put in the chat earlier. So if you want to fill out a survey about what you think is important in the next city manager, uh, again, go on the website. Great, thank you, Beth. Karen. Um, to Beth's point about um, city council race, I just wanna put a shout out that on Thursday, April 29th, um, BCCI will be um, hosting the voters forum so you will be able to virtually see the candidates for city council race and the candidates for THPRD. We haven't set everything in stone yet, but um, we will not be covering the Beaverton School District because they have their own voters forum, but we will do the other races. So April 29th, Thursday, I think it's 6.30, maybe seven o'clock. I can get more detailed information. Thanks, Sharon. I'm, I'm sorry. Did we end up doing a motion to have a longer meeting at next month? I'm sorry. Were we going to do the, the retreat from 6 to 8.30 PM? Was that what we did? did I don't think there was a motion. I think it was decided that we would have the meeting that day and the committee would decide if there was a second day or, or redoing the schedule. I, I guess I'm also unclear on, on that. Do we need to have a motion, Beth? If we, I mean, if we change the time from the regular time, yeah, I guess we probably should. We make a motion that we have a meeting a half hour ahead. I second. Second. <laughs> um, all those in favor say aye. Or a thumbs up, please. Great. Anyone opposed? No, but can you tell me who seconded? Uh, I think I did, Jane. Jane All right, thanks, Jane. Thank you. All right, uh, Beth, did you have anything else for your staff updates? No. Nope. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and thank you, everyone, uh, for staying over. Um, we really appreciate your patience um, and contributions. The, the next thing is if there's any new business anyone wants to bring forth and put on the table as we move forward. Something I wanted to just quickly throw out, I know in the past um, our, our commission has received t-shirts um, that have the Beaverton Art, Art Lives Here logo on them. I wanted to just quickly ask if the commission would be interested um, uh, if we could maybe look into masks instead that have uh, the Beaverton Art Lives Here logo on there. Is that something uh, folks would be interested in? I see Shelly has a thumbs up and Jim. As long as it's not screen printed because that prevents air from flowing through. 
I'm okay sure. with that. <laughs> um, so um, Beth, I think um, I think Debbie had uh, previously uh, done the t-shirt orders for us. Is that something that that maybe you or, or your staff could look into if, if masks yeah, I can, are? Yeah, I can look into it. We have lots of, we do have lots of uh, t-shirts um, and long sleeve shirts um, in our swag bag already. So we could certainly give those. They're actually really nice. They're really nice shirts. Um, so if people want any of those, we can share those. I don't know how long it would, you know, how we would go about having masks made. We'd have to do some research on that. I do know that the city was talking about having city of Beaverton masks made, but I'm not sure where they ended up. Um, we do have a small amount of money in our budget still for this fiscal year for swag. Um, so I'll, I will, I can look into it, um, and let, and let you know. Great. Thank you. And I see, I see Shelly's hand and Shelly, you're muted. Sorry. The city of Beaverton does have masks because I have one and Mark has one. So oh. they're very nice. So maybe we can find out how we can have an arts logo. Great, thanks, Shelly. Okay, and Beth, thank you for looking into the ordering on that. Um, appreciate it. All right, if there's no other uh, further comments or questions, I uh, will adjourn this meeting. And thank you so much to everyone. Uh, it's really great to see you all. And thanks for your advocacy for the arts uh, here in Beaverton. Thank you. Thank you. To our guests. Yes, yes. Thank you to our guests. Thanks, Sharon.